Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, my name is Iris Caldwell. I'm at the University of Illinois Chicago, and I also serve on the board for the Chicago Living Corridors. I'm very pleased to have Peggy Simonson with me this evening. Uh, she's also on the board of the Chicago Living Corridors, um, but also works very closely with the Citizens for Conservation group, um, and will be providing our evening webinar uh, this evening called Identifying and Controlling Invasive Plants. Before we get started, I have just a couple of logistics items. Um, all of you attendees are in mute uh, mode right now at the start of the webinar. Uh, when we get to the questions and answer session at the end, uh, we can unmute folks if you have something you'd like to say or we'd like to have some more extensive discussion. Um, otherwise, if you have any questions or technical issues, um, go ahead and chat those into the chat box. You can do that at any point during the webinar. Um, and we will then respond um, as soon as we can um, to your technical issues, but then um, save your questions to the end um, for, for Peggy. In addition, um, we are recording this evening's session and we'll make available a recording of the webinar on the Chicago Living Corridors website. Uh, we'll send out an email when that's available. Um, so stay tuned uh, for, for that. So I am uh, also going to provide just a couple of um, background slides on Chicago Living Corridors for those of you who are not familiar with our organization. Uh, Chicago Living Corridors really formed um, as a umbrella organization to support private landowners across the Chicagoland area um, in helping them to achieve uh, native plantings um, on their lands to really help support this connected network of native um, plantings across the region. The focus on private landowners um, is key given the significance of private land ownership across Illinois, um, 90 to 95 percent. And certainly we've seen um, in literature and research that this connectivity of small stepping stones of native plantings across the landscape can be really beneficial for a variety of uh, wildlife, um, including pollinators. One of the other activities that Chicago Living Corridors does is we have a map online that you can actually map out um, where your habitat occurs across the Chicagoland area. And again, this is intended to help us visualize these networks of, of connected habitat across the region. Through our work, we also work to inform and inspire residents to plant native plants and encourage them to join a variety of conservation organizations that are active in the region. As I mentioned, Chicago Living Corridors is an umbrella organization. Um, these are the founding organizations that were involved in establishing Chicago Living Corridors. Citizens for Conservation, um, particularly through their Habitat Corridors program, the Wildlife Preservation and Propagation Committee, um, which has a mentoring program called A Natural Garden in Your Yard. The Conservation Foundation and their Conservation at Home and Conservation at Work programs. And then also Northern Cane Wild Ones and West Cook Wild Ones chapters um, have also been very active and supportive of the Chicago Living Quarters. In addition to these founding member organizations, we have a number of other participating organizations as shown here on this slide, um, many of whom are also tracking and mapping habitat um, through conservation at home. And these sites um, and locations then are captured, um, as I mentioned, in our online map, uh, which you can access through the Chicago Living Corridors website. At the end of the presentation tonight, uh, we have all the details about how to access the website, so uh, stay tuned for that. But as you can see, we have a significant number of private landowners across the region that are actively um, planting native plants um, and helping to contribute to these really connected corridors across the region. So that's just a very brief introduction to Chicago Living Corridors. Um, next, I am going to happily turn things over to Peggy Simonson, who again will be presenting uh, tonight's presentation on identifying and controlling invasive plants. So with that, Peggy, I'll turn it to you. Thanks, Iris. And welcome, everybody. Glad you're joining us. 
Uh, I'm assuming that we have some people in the audience who have a lot of experience working with invasive plants, but you're adding to your knowledge perhaps tonight, and we may have some who are having a hard time identifying some of the things and wondering what, which ones are invasive. So we hope we'll be able to get, I have some good photos for you to be able to see what some of these look like. Did I skip a slide here? Here we are. Ah. There we go. I'll get my buttons clicked here. Um, we're going to talk about why things are invasive. Uh, I have 12 specific plants that we'll be talking about, both the ecological impact that they have, how to control them, and then what to, to put in their place. In many cases, that's a, a critical step to keep the bad guys from coming back. We'll have some conclusions and I will share with you some invasive species resources, some ways that you can get, get uh, them. So if you want more information or you may want a printed flyer so you can take it out and look at the photo along with the plants you might be trying to identify. So why are the things that we call invasive invasive? Um, most of them were imported from Europe and Asia. Some of them came with the settlers like buckthorn, uh, the Germans brought that, uh, the German farmers that came to this northwestern, or northeastern Illinois area, because it is so dense and so uh, gnarly that they used it as fences. They didn't have to build fences, they could keep their cattle in with that. Of course, it's escaped from that use and, and is in really totally invas invading our area now. But nurseries also, there are a number of plants that nurseries used to import and sell and landscape plants. Uh, an example of that is the Norway maple that, that is not a good plant for our area. And we'll talk about each of these. In some cases, the nurseries have gotten the message and, and in some cases they, they are not even allowed to import some of these bad plants again because they've, they've made, done so much damage. So almost all of them have these issues that they spread aggressively sometimes by both the seed and the roots, which is makes them double trouble. Um, they destroy biodiversity because they get so dense or they take over an area so thickly that nothing else can grow. Or in some cases, they poison the soil so nothing else will grow. And consequently, they don't provide any services to our ecosystem. Birds don't like them, butterflies don't like them, even deer don't eat them, unfortunately. So. Uh, they, they are not um, host plants for the, the, the good uh, pollinators, for example, that we want. So here are the ones I'm going to be talking about. Um, the, there, there, there is a, a couple of good native honeysuckles, but the, the imported one, the, the invasive one is a bush honeysuckle. Also in the roses, there are some native roses. Uh, you know, the, there's a, 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 a one that's, that grows on the edges of, of high quality woodlands, but the multiflora it goes everywhere and takes over. Uh, you probably know about or have heard about garlic mustard, but that's another one that was imported. Um, I'm not sure where Dame's Rocket came from originally, but probably came in as a, as a landscape plant because People think it looks pretty until it takes over everything. Uh, and, and then teasel is another one, a couple of the thistles. And then in the wetlands, if any of you either have or live near wet areas, you may have had to deal with purple loosestrife, reed canary grasses everywhere. It's a wetland plant, but by gosh, it'll go wherever it wants and, and take over. Common reed is sort of the same. It's, it's in the wetlands and in fact, choking them out, but, but uh, it, it's so uh, aggressive that it'll, it'll go most everywhere. And then the one tree we have on the list, there are others we could put on here like the uh, uh, Bradford pear, but uh, I don't have that here, but we're going to be talking about the Norway maple. So these are the 12, and we're gonna talk a little more in detail about each of them. Ta-da, here's the buckthorn. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like up close. And you can see it has these black berries in the fall. And its problem is not only does it cast the dense shade, but it also changes the soil characteristics. Things can't grow under it, uh, partly because the shade is so dense 
It, it, it can be growing under oaks, but we won't see any little baby oaks coming up because the, the buckthorn's just keeping them out. Um, and I don't know if you noticed here, I'll go back to its um, species name, Cathartica, because it, it, when birds eat the seeds, they go right through them. It works like, like a laxative, a catharsis. And, and that's one of the problems because then the birds poop them wherever they happen to be and spread the seeds all over the place. So uh, instead of helping something that we want to have spread, it's cause, it causing more problems. You can tell if you, this, this photo shows the, the, in the fall, when, uh, I don't know, a, a hickory or I don't know what kind of ash maybe is bright yellow, the, the buckthorn never change color. They just stay dark green all year. They come out early in the spring and they're the last thing with the leaves still on them in the fall, which is also part of the problem with anything else wanting to grow. They've stolen all the sunlight. To get rid of these, if they're little and in the spring, uh, if you've got little shoots, you can pull them when the ground is soft. Most of the time, however, by the time we're getting around to getting rid of them, we're cutting them. And you have to, if, when, when you cut it, you need to cut enough up above the soil so that you can still see the stump and all of the little shoots around it. And then you really have to herbicide. I'm going to be talking a lot about herbiciding tonight, and we don't usually do that when we're talking about native plants. We're absolutely not wanting to use herbicide. But, but in the case of buckthorn, if you don't, if you just cut it, it will for sure come back bigger and bushier than, than before. Um, and and uh, the herbicide, the, rec the way we recommend doing that instead of spraying is if you have one stump, for example, is to, to use a paintbrush in, in, the, in the herbicide and just literally paint the stump or the little, the little shoot stumps that are around it. Um, and particularly if there's other good things growing around it. Now, if you have a big massive area of them and you're cutting it all, you probably want to be, be spraying it. But, but we tend to recommend when you're using herbicide to do it with a paintbrush or a sponge. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, just, to, just to keep the herbicide on the one plant that you want to be trying to kill. Burning works, uh, I'm not sure how much of that's going to be appropriate for homeowners, but in uh, Citizens for Conservation's prairies, for example, when we do a, a controlled burn in the early spring, it, it does help cut the, the, uh, the, the buckthorn it, it keeps the little sprouts from, from growing. It won't kill a big, a big buckthorn bush, but it'll keep little sprouts down. And by education, we mean people need to learn about buckthorn. Um, one of the towns in the Barrington area that Citizens for Conservation serves is Barrington Hills. And those properties are zoned five acres. And in some cases, they have three acres of lawn and two acres of buckthorn. And the problem is they have very typically have the buckthorn around as a, as a screen around along the road or something, not knowing that it's also taking off and, and you know, spreading into everybody else's yard and into the forest preserves and everywhere else. So what we try to do is educate people and uh, help them see that there are things that you can do as replacements that are much better plants, better ecosystem services, better looking, uh, better, partners with other plants in the area. One of them is a, the black hob viburnum, which gets this beautiful red color in the fall, a nice big bushy plant. And if you have several buckthorns along an edge and you want to fill it in, you'd put two or three maybe of the black hob viburnums. I have to give you a little uh, warning right now about planting viburnums. Um, there's, a, there's for the first time ever in the last three years, a viburnum borer that has gotten, it gets in uh, and you start seeing the leaves chewed. And the Morton Arboretum recommends that you just clip off the leaves that are chewed or the stems that they're on, because if you look at a stem where the borers are, you see little brown bumps along it. Um, but I have to say that I have lost, I think, 15 different viburnums in my yard in the last three years. And I've been meticulously cutting the leaves that have been chewed, but, but the little borers apparently just get in and keep chewing at it. And, after, and the leaves will come back at, for a while, but then after they keep getting chewed, the, the plant dies. So um, it's a wonderful plant otherwise, any of the viburnums, but, but uh, just a word of caution if you're, if you're going that direction. 
Uh, I'd be interested to know how many of you have experienced uh, the, and it's only the viburnums. It doesn't seem to go on to other, other uh, shrubs at all. Another good alternative is a black chokeberry. It's not quite as bushy typically as the, the black haw, but, but it's, a, it's a very nice plant. Lovely red berries that the, that the birds do like to eat. Uh, the, and the service berry, the amelanchers, um, there's, there's two of them. One's a little bit better in sh sh a little more shade and, and the, the uh, uh, other one for sun. Um, uh, but again, it's a beautiful plant, has a nice shape to it, gets a beautiful white flowers. This photo unfortunately doesn't do it justice, but, but it, it really is a very attractive tree that gets shrubby so that it serves as a, a barrier too. And of course, elderberries. Uh, and they have the flowers in the spring and then um, the berries in the fall and, and the birds like them. And even if you get them before the birds get them, you can make elderberry jam out of them. So lots of good alternatives. There's no reason to keep the buckthorn if, the, if what you're looking for is a screen. Okay, let's now take a look at this bush honeysuckle. This one is really nasty to select one of John Donald Trump's favorite words. <laughs> He's not talking about honeysuckle when he says it, but uh, it, it is um, very um, gnarly. It, it spreads wide as well as, as tall. And, and the, the, uh, the stalks, the stems just go every which way. And if you prune a couple of them, it'll shoot them out in a new direction. So. Once again, you have to cut the stumps and herbicide. Uh, I put hard to kill on here because if you just do a little bit of herbicide, it'll come back around the edges. You really do have to, to paint the whole stump and all the little shoots that are going out in all directions. Um, I, I had a couple of big ones way back in my back 40 by the fence that I didn't go back there very often. And every once in a while, I'd, I'd take the loppers and cut some off and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And finally, uh, last spring when it was really, really wet, my son was home and I said, can you cut that with a chainsaw so I can get through to the stumps? And he went out there and literally pulled it up by the roots. So it, it, it's possible to do that when the ground is that soft. So, and, and if it's little, you can hand pull but mostly it's cutting and herbiciding and, and it'll, it'll re-sprout. So if there's a little sprout on one side or the other, you need to make sure that you get your herbicide on those leaves as well. And again, some of the same replacements that you would have for uh, the, the buckthorn, because you're, if you want to replace a, a, a bulky shrub, these get to be a little big, bit bigger. If, in fact, you have a honeysuckle in a spot that you don't want it to be quite so, buck, so bulky, so, you know, it's not trying to be a shade, we have some other <clears throat> possibilities. Actually, the service berry uh, can, can be more of a tree at the base with the flowers bushing out at the top rather than a, uh, putting all the dense shade underneath it. And then we'll move on to the multiflora rose. This one is really difficult to work with because as roses do, it is full of thorns. It has pretty white flowers on it in the spring, but it's just dense thickets and it binds around and tangles up. Uh, it, if you're going, if, what, you, you can't just bend down into it and cl clip it with a lopper at the bottom because you'll get thorns all over you. So, you, you know, you cut off this branch and then you cut off that branch and you, you know, have to keep going until you get deep enough to be able to get the uh, down toward the, 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 the stump or stumps because it's, there's never a single one I and mean, there's never just one rose plant there all over the place. Um, and, and one of its problems is that, it, that it, it has such a root system going all the way through the area that it's, it's getting, crowding out other things, good things. So, um, again, the only time you could hand pull this is if you, there's one little sprout, but most of the time you're going to have bunches of them and you're probably going to have to depend on the herbiciding. And this, like those other two, if you're doing it, make sure you're getting every stump and every twig that is left on there, otherwise it'll just be sprout. <laughs> They're that aggressive. Some replacements here, the nine bar of Physocarpus is, is a, a, a very nice shrub. Uh, again, uh, bushy, not, not invasively bushy, but, but nice big shape to it, or the black chokeberry. 
The chokeberry usually is a little bit airier, not quite so dense as some of these other ones. And da-da, here's garlic mustard. I expect most of you have heard about it, have been pulling it, have been dealing with it. Um, this is what it looks like when it's a year old. It's a, it's a biennial. And so you see these little rosettes and there's zillions of them typically in the ground. When it's, a, it's second year growth, it gets this tall spike on it with a white flower on the end. And it is, it's one of those that spreads both by roots and seeds. And the problem is if you leave one stalk with the flowers on it and you, you see it and you don't worry about it or you didn't know it was there, the next year you'll have a thousand. I mean, it just, the seeds just spread like wildfire. And it, it literally will blanket the ground and there'll be nothing else allowed to grow there. Um, and because it's not a native, the native insects don't like it and or the other wildlife. But interestingly, it is edible, not after you've herbicided it, I hope, but uh, this is another one that the settlers brought in because it stays green until December and it greens comes up early in the spring, usually in March here. And, and so, you know, and you can, you literally can put it in a salad if you like the idea, I don't, but, but it is edible. Um, so that's why it's here, but it has totally escaped wherever it was originally planted and it's taken over. And this is one of the ones that uh, you might want to, if you have a neighbor who has this on their property, as I did, I was busy pulling mine. By the way, it pulls pretty easily in the spring. Uh, when the ground is soft, when it's first coming up, if you get your hand right down at the at the top of the root, you can literally pull the, the thing out, root and all. Uh, and I was busy doing that in a little back patch in my yard every year. And then I'd look over the fence at my neighbors and it, just a big mass of, of garlic mustard over there. So I went and asked him if he minded if I herbicided it because it kept you know coming back into my yard. And, and as we said in the introduction, that these guys don't know property lines. So if there's in what you have, your neighbors have them, you're likely to too. So uh, the cutting would be if, if there's such a big patch and you can't get them, and especially later in the summer, and when this, or the flowers are on them, if you can't pull it, you, the, you're better off cutting it than not doing anything because you want to get the, 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 the flower stalks off of there before they go to seed. And by the way, don't put them in a compost pile. Uh, any of these mostly, you really want to bag them and, and have the, the village take them away and their composts get much hotter than our little ones in our yard typically. Uh, and, and it's possible to use a, a, a weed torch. Most of us don't, aren't doing that, but the restoration people will do that on occasion when they have a huge, huge area of this. Now, this is one of the ones that you really do want to be ready with a, re a replacement because if you have a big patch and you've pulled them, the ground is bare, except there are still garlic mustard seeds down there. And so you want to get some other plants in there that will help outcompete the seeds growing back. And by the way, you have to go back another year. You'll never ever get it all in the, the first, first year if you haven't been working on it for a while. A good, nice little native plant to put in its place is a Jacob's Ladder that has a nice little clump flower, but it does spread its seeds and, and rhizomes so that it'll, it'll fill in an area very nicely and have lovely purple flowers in the spring. And unlike some of the spring ephemerals, it stays all summer. So you still have a plant there even after the flowers are done. Another good uh, <clears throat> replacement, it, particularly if you want a ground cover, is the wild ginger. That too spreads very nicely and is a, is a nice looking plant. Uh, it does die back completely in the winter, so you don't see anything there, but, but uh, it's there and it'll come back again nice and full in the, ne the next spring. And again, for ground cover or uh, under, under trees particularly, uh, the, there are other sedges too, but the pen sedge is one that's particularly adapted to oak woods. It's called an oak sedge as well. Uh, and, and it stays in clumps like you're seeing here, but it also, and it doesn't, you don't have to cut it. You know, it doesn't get so tall that it's looking weedy. It just stays in about maybe eight inch tall clumps and, and really good replacement for when you're wanting to fill a lot of soil in a hurry to keep the bad guys from coming back. There are other sedges, depending on how wet an area might be or how much sun, but the pen sedge is one for dry shade that is, works well. And they're not too many. Ginger is another one for dry sage, although ginger likes to be a little bit wetter or it'll, it'll turn 
you'll die back too soon. Um, we typically don't say we need to water our native plants. And, and I have a, a, an edging of ginger along my sidewalk. And <clears throat> along about like last week before these last rains, it was getting pretty dry. So I was watering it because I don't want it to turn yellow in August. It can do that in October, but I'd like to keep it green this time of year. <coughs> And here's Dame's Rocket. I don't know if you noticed the, the photo on the on the opening slide. I hope you didn't think that was pretty, but a lot of people do. Um, that, in fact, is why Dame's Rocket is sort of allowed in places, because it, it is kind of pretty. It looks like flocks. But you need to pay attention that here's the slide we had, because it, it will absolutely take over. Sometimes it's more of that purple color, and sometimes lavender, and sometimes it's a little whiter or paler. As, it gets, as the flowers get older. But it is so uh, profuse with its seeds that it'll fill in a whole area. This is a corner uh, by two roads, and it's just a mass of it. Uh, and, and the problem, even if somebody wants it in one area, it doesn't stay there. As it says, it really gets into the natural areas. And uh, one of the plants that a whole lot of the restoration volunteers are, are pulling in the spring all the time is Dame's Rocket. Let me go back to this and tell you how you, you tell the difference between this and phlox. Notice that these flowers have four petals, the crucifix, uh, the cross shape. Uh, phlox has five petals. So if you see a tall, plant that gets to be, oh, 30 inches, maybe 36 inches tall, it could, if you want to make sure it's not phlox, just look closely at one of the flowers. If it's four petals, it's Dame's Rocket. And here's a, a closer picture, again, when it's a little bit, uh, not, not as lavender, but it's faded a bit. Uh, this one, if the ground is sort of soft, you can pull. Uh, its roots are, uh, it spreads by roots, but, but they're not uh, a, a big mass, so you can get it pulled. But again, if you have a big area, uh, you may want to herbicide it instead. And once again, education, we have to have people know the difference between Dame's Rocket and Phlox, and, and or recognize that if there's a big mass of it, it it's Dame's Rocket, and, and we need to get rid of it before it gets any worse. Again, depending on what kind of uh, environment it's in, the the Phlox maculatum, the wild sweet William, uh, is is a, a lovely plant, or marsh phlox if it's a little wetter. <clears throat> and again, each of those will have five petals. The butterfly weed, uh, one of the milkweeds, the Asclepias tuberosa, is uh, for for drier it would want dry sun, whereas the marsh phlox doesn't have to be a marsh, but it likes it a little wetter. Uh, in the marsh milkweed, uh, again, it, it's, that's just its name, but it, it does like to be moister than the butterfly weed. So those are some wonderful choices to, to, <clears throat> to put in place. Or a uh, purple coneflower if you want one. Well, the, the phlox get tall. The coneflower, as you probably know, gets to be about two to three feet tall as well uh, and, and spreads nicely so that uh, the, the butterfly weed is a little more conservative in its spreading. It gets to be a nice, larger uh, clump plant, but it, it's not aggressively spreading, whereas the, the coneflowers do. If you want something to fill in fast, that would be a good one to, to think about as well. Whipping right along here, teasel. Um, we see this along the railroad tracks, along the roadsides, uh, in the fields. Um, some people say they like it for dried bouquets, but if that's the case, pick one and then get rid of the plant <laughs> if pick a bouquet. Make sure you're not picking seeds with you. But most of us by now recognize that that's not something that we want to have around. This is what the <clears throat> seed heads look like before they're dried up like the other ones. Uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, I'm not sure if we can see the leaves. See if I can get you a photo here. This is what the, the, the leaves look like. There's a whorl base. And uh, again, if you have a plant or two, you can dig. But boy, these things spread so, so aggressively that you're better off cutting them. But if you do, you really should herbicide. And whatever you do, don't leave the seed heads on the ground. That's one of the things that's helped them spread. The, people cutting along the roadsides who will cut them and this, just leave them there. And all they've done is help them spread into a wider area with their seeds coming out of the seed head. So 
you really do need to get out the herbicide on these guys. Some possible replacements, if you want a tall plant, where Antiesel is tall, it gets to be maybe five, six, even taller than that. Uh, the big blue stem is a tall plant, uh, but, but nice big grasses, you know, that, that uh, would fill in a space. Little blue stem is beautiful. It's, it, it is littler. It's actually not the same uh, genus even, even though they're both called blue stem. But the little blue stem only gets to be about maybe 30 inches tall and nice clumps and it gets these feathery little seeds on them in the fall and the beautiful color. It's not blue, but it but it's a, a very showy uh, plant. It's a, it's a prairie plant, but it's a lovely landscape plant as well. That would be such a nice replacement wherever you're doing it for teasel. And another tall one is Indian grass. Now this gets really tall. And so if you have, if the teasel was off in a, in a, in a back area and you just want to fill the, the land, the ground, so something else, so more teasel seeds don't come up, Indian grass would be. That's not a good landscape plant. It gets too tall, but the little blue stem is great for a garden bed as well as a, a prairie. Okay, we get into the thistles now. Um, there are some native thistles, but they're very rare. Most of what we see are the invasive ones. This is the bull thistle, which is sort of pretty as a flower, but boy, it's a, a chore. Uh, and, and as you know, with thistles, it, you have to have gloves and long sleeves on if you're digging, getting down into this, because it really sets its, sets its seeds in, in an area all the way around and outcompetes any natives. If they just take over roots and seeds. This one you can mow, but I would again recommend if you mow it before the seeds have set, it's possible that they will still ripen even lying on the ground. So when if you mow if you mow it, I would certainly suggest that you you bag up the the seed heads and get rid of them. As I mentioned, hand pulling is hard unless you have some thick gloves on, um, and and you you can herbicide. Uh, Typically, if you're going to herbicide it, it's best to cut it first and then and then herbicide the stump because otherwise you're going to have this awful thing hanging around while it dies as it's standing there. Oops, we're just saying it's not necessary to put a replacement. These typically pop up here and there, and it's not like you're likely having a whole garden full of them. And the same thing is true with the Canada thistle. <clears throat> it's a little shorter. Uh, but but still a thistle, still a very aggressive guy. Um, again, prolific seeds makes it very invasive. The leaf on this is a little bit wider. If you yeah, see on the uh, the previous one, um, now in this case, again it outcompetes the natives. That's the problem with all the invasives; they they take over. Um, but if you if you just cut this off, it would come right back up from the stem and the root. So you really do want to either dig it, which you can do uh, if if you just have a few of them, or uh, again hand pulling. I I tend to to think of digging when I, I instead of just trying to pull these some of these up from the ground, I'll I'll use a little spade around them and loosen it and then pull it out. So you're getting the root out that way, or or mowing. And as I said, if you're if you're mowing, you're best to to cut the to gather up the the, the <clears throat> seed heads that have been cut off, so they don't just lie there and produce seeds. <clears throat> Some of them, depending on how how far along they are in seed production, uh, they can still germinate and they can still ripen after after they've been cut off their food source. So, and of course herbicides. You might want some replacements for these. Um, now, a lot of these are interchangeable. Uh, the yellow cone flowers are, are uh, get to, uh, to be a little bit taller, I think, than the purple cone flower, but a nice spreading uh, prairie plant. Lots of different native asters that will spread and take their place, and or black-eyed Susans. Uh, which are blooming right now, and and are you know you, you probably see lots of these around. These are all three of these are pretty aggressive. They can they can push back against some bad things. They're not they're not tender little little ones that are going to get crowded out very easily. So once you've got the bad ones out, once again be ready to to get something else in their place. 
And here's one of the ones that has in, in the past really taken over our wetlands. Uh, again, it's, it's not too bad looking. It has a purple flower on it, but boy, it just takes over. Uh, and it is typically in uh, along the edges of lakes and streams, uh, takes the, the uh, it's so prolific that it takes the space that you might want some, uh, some nicer natives along the wetland edge, some sedges or whatever. So um, again, it decreases biodiversity. The, the, the bees and, and butterflies are much less likely to use this than they are the native plants. Um, and the, um, one of the things that uh, has been done with this, uh, you see the, the biocontrol on here, some years ago, um, I think Iris might be able to answer questions about this. The, uh, she works with the right-of-way organization. Um, along the roadsides, they were importing a, a beetle that apparently uh, eats the purple loosestrife and, and damages it enough to kill it. Uh, now, I'm always very concerned when you import one kind of invasive to deal with another kind of invasive, but I think it really did make a difference. It cut them back substantially. They're coming back a little bit now, but not as badly as they, as they were. Um, but if you see them, if you even have a few plants, get, up, get rid of them before they get to be taking over. So again, not, not likely to need a replacement because they're, they're on the water's edge and you may just want to have the water's edge be there and not have these big bushy plants taking up space. Here's another wetland plant that is just everywhere. Really, really annoying. Um, it, it has filled in so many of our wetlands. Uh, I live just off Quentin Road in, in between east side of Barrington, west side of Palatine. And there used to be a very nice wetland in the Deer Grove Forest Preserve. And now as you drive by, all you, you don't see even this much water. You see just a little bit of water and the rest of it is reed canary grass and cattails and the invasive cattails at that. And uh, Phragmites, a giant reed, which I'll show you next. But um, this one is really difficult to pull because it has such a, a, a clump of roots. And this is a little clump of grass. If you have a big clump of grass, you're going to have Notice that the, the roots are actually wider at the base than the plant is. So if you have a, a four foot tall clump of reed canary, it's, and, and it, it's probably got a, a, a root ball that is 12 inches across or something. Um, so it's got this heavy layer of thatch that, that suppresses other vegetation, but it also just it can come up amongst everything and, and take over. And it really doesn't have, provide any, any uh, ecosystem services. It's just in the way. Uh, deer don't, of course, deer don't eat any grass. Here's what uh, the seeds look like when it's blooming. Um, hand pulling, you can really only do that if it's a brand new little plant. I have hand pulled some, but mostly you have to dig. But even that's a problem. If it's, I have, I had it coming along my stream bank, and the problem was the root ball was so big that if I dug it out, I took a big chunk of the root of the uh, stream bank with it. And uh, so then there's the problem of erosion. Um, better, a, a better way to deal with it is, is to use black plastic to smother it. So in the fall, for example, you would put the black, you'd cut it and then put the black, or mow it as it says here, put the black plastic over it put a couple of several inches of mulch on top of the black plastic to hold it down. And by spring, it will have smothered it. The, the, the roots will be dead, but they will disintegrate, you know, and into making uh, compost in the soil. And, and you haven't taken away your stream bank uh, by, by taking it out that way. Uh, but the other possibility is also to, to, uh, to cut an herbicide. You can spray herbicide the whole thing if, if that's all that's there and you don't have anything good around. Um, you're probably better though if you cut it or mow it and then herbicide the cut so you're getting closer to the root and you're using less herbicide and it's not out and around in the air. It's just right down on the base of the plant. 
some replacements, a couple of the grasses or the cord grass, uh, you know, the, the, depending on how wet it is. By the way, the reed canary doesn't, it's, it's always in the wetlands, but it's other places too. I'm a weed monitor, a weed scout for a deer grove east, a uh, new restoration. And I, you know, I walk through the woods and I'm, I'm pulling reed canary grass. It's not, it's, it's thick by the ponds, but uh, it, it'll grow elsewhere. So cord grass is one possible uh, replacement, but some of the sedges as well. This one, the long bracts tussock sedge is a, is a water sedge, uh, Carex aquatilis. Uh, but there are other wetland sedges as well, depending on how much sun you want. I have a shady rain garden and I have the uh, burr sedge in that. And, and that's a, it's a neat plant and it has an interesting little burr head on it. So look at lots of sedges as replaces, replacements for reed canary if you're taking out uh, a big area of it. How are we doing on time? Got a couple more here. The common reed is just an awful plant. Uh, it is, it gets to be eight, even 10 feet tall. You'll see it anywhere there's a wetland, even little ditches alongside the road if there's rainwater accumulates in it. Uh, and it's very, very aggressive. Um, it, it is, it's, it gets to be such a mass that it blocks everything else. And of course, eliminates any diversity in the, in the, in the wetland area. If there was any arrowhead, arrow leaves or anything going that was good, they will have been blocked out by these guys. And again, doesn't nobody nobody likes it. The birds and bees don't don't want to be dealing with this. Um, and it it is so aggressive. Its roots spread so badly. Here you can kind of see the the density and the and the, looking at the the way that the stem and the leaves come off the stem is kind of a a key indicator of it. Um, again, if you have just a little bit, you can dig. Um, I'm working with a, an area, my, my church has some native plantings, but they allowed a, a little wetland to get uh, the com this Phragmites, the common reed in it. And uh, so we've hired a, a, um, a man, that, a company that works with, with native plants, but, but he, 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 he came in and did a section by herbiciding it first with a sponge where you, you wear rubber gloves, put your herbicide in a bucket or a cup or something and a sponge and you literally can run the sponge up along these leaves and uh, that, that will kill the plant. Uh, if you have a big massive area though, that, what he, he did and the rest of it was to mow it and then come in after that it was mowed and herbicided it. And once, once it's completely died back. We're going to plant. We're not going to put the tall these tall things in though, because it's it's an area that shouldn't have gotten tall in the first place. But we definitely are going to put some sedges in. Well, the, the tussock sedge doesn't get that tall. It's about maybe 18, 15, 18 inches or so. Um, or or some of the other sedges we're going to be put in in the in the place of it. But uh, it it if you if you see it if you live in a it, like in a in a subdivision around a lake, very likely you have this common reed in the water. And rather than you personally having to try to get it out or even with a team, you're better off hiring a, 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 a native plant contractor to get it out of the area for you. It, it's, uh, it's that difficult and that annoying and that hard to get rid of. And the one tree we had on here, the reason this is on here is because it's not a native. As you know, it's a Norway maple. And it is a nice shaped tree, but it gets so dense that this, these branches at the bottom uh, cut out the shade for anything else. We have people saying, well, you know, what can I plant out of my, my Norway maple? And we say nothing. You can you maybe get some weeds, but you're best off if you have one to, to get any, any uh, growth under there out and in fact put uh, uh, wood chips down. But one of the, the problems is that it just sends seedlings up everywhere. And so you're constantly pulling or cutting or whatever with those. Um, and there are some nice alternatives. Uh, again, education. Um, one, one of our 
naturalists with Citizens for Conservation says, says the control method is cut it down. <laughs> no. Well, sometimes we have people that have to live with something a while and see how bad it is before they're willing to cut a live tree down. But, but uh, educating again on, on how, and, and this, is a, this is a prime example of the ones that the, that the nurseries brought in um, because it grows fast and it's hardy and so forth, but boy, it's a, a, a difficult one. Get a sugar maple instead. Now those are lovely, lovely trees and, and they don't uh, make it, the, the, they're not so dense that it gets dense shade underneath. Or an American linden is another, a, a different species, in, but an, a, an interesting shaped tree and a very nice one that turns nice color in the fall as well. So, Here's what we know. We can't totally eliminate the invasive species, but we can control them. And particularly if you're working in your own yard or in a neighborhood area where you can manage the, the size of them before they get too out of control, that's a good, good way to, to get going after them. And as I said, with most of them, you want replacements ready when you're re removing the invasive plants so the invasive seeds don't just come right back up again. Uh, although with the buckthorn, you want to wait a bit because the, uh, we want to get the, the soil turned over or aerated a little bit so that it doesn't have the, the uh, chemical in it that kills things. And for sure, when you replace them, plant natives. So here are some of the resources we have available. Um, on, on the citizensforconservation.org website, under education, under resources, you have flyers of, of uh, well, each, there are six, six flyers that have photos on one side and how to deal with it on the other. And if, for example, you have either some plants you're trying to identify or you have some neighbors that have buckthorn or garlic mustard or whatever and you're trying to get rid of it, it, it might be worth it to, to print out one of these flyers and take it to them and show them that this is indeed what they've got and this is how they get rid of it. Uh, there's also a video on the CFC website uh, on, on the actual process of <coughs> herbiciding and getting rid of some plants. Uh, there are also some invasive plant species tables, so lots more invasive species with a little bit of information on how to get rid of them, not as detailed as the flyers. And Citizens for Conservation's home visit program is called Habitat Corridors. We go to homeowners or property owners in the greater Barrington area. But if you're outside of that area, as most of you, many of you are, uh, you know, the, the uh, Conservation Foundation has the uh, uh, Conservation at Home program or Conservation at Work uh, that a number of organizations are using uh, that, that uh, do the home visits and, and help you identify invasive species and what might be a good replacement. We just put a, a couple of suggestions here, but in many cases, there's lots of really good native possibilities to take their place. Uh, and of course, go to native plant sales in the spring. CFC has ours the first week in May every year. And the Chicago Living Corridors website also has, by the way, it also has these, these flyers. We, we put them from CFC onto that. Um, I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, we, all of these photos, by the way, are, are, are local. They're in our, our yards or were, or in the neighborhood, or uh, out in the, in the CFC properties, the archives. So we didn't just go to the internet to get them. They're different species of things. So um, we'll get you some more resources in a minute here. We want you to plant natives, get rid of the invasives and plant natives instead and spread the word, help other people learn about the bad things if you see them on somebody else's property. Uh, both, both Chicago Living Corridors and, Chicago, and Citizens for Conservation have Facebook posts that we're talking about natives and various uh, projects or resources or whatever, lots of good information. Uh, if you already have good habitat on your yard and, and would would be interested in if you take a look at the map that I was talked about earlier on the on the Chicago Living Corridors website. It's actually an interactive map, and the dots are colored based on which organization is the participating organization that did the the assessments for those. So if you 
if you're an individual and you have a good property, but you want your map, your dot on the map, you need to go through one of the organizations uh, that we listed at the beginning <coughs> and or are listed on the, the um, Chicago Living Corridors website. Um, but we also uh, would be willing to, to talk with you about volunteering with the Chicago Living Corridors. We're a totally volunteer organization. We have no paid staff. And uh, so we, we thrive on volunteers and we are lucky to have Iris doing the technical connections with these uh, uh, webinars we're doing. And uh, Carol Rice is listening in and she's uh, the president of Chicago Living Corridors and just a wealth of, of resources. So here's the, the uh, website there for you to go. And, and by the way, on the CLC website, again, to find the, the, the um, invasive flyers, go under, the, I should have written down the native plant section, but look for the word resources and that's where you'll find those as well. So our next program is going to be on September 23rd, same time, a Wednesday at 7 p.m. And it's the native bumblebees in your own backyard. Um, Brandy Dunn, who is the presenter, is, is really, really a knowledgeable bee lady, and she's got wonderful photos, so this will be a great, great presentation for you to see as well. Here's contact information again. Oh, did we leave, did we not leave up the, the next meeting sign long enough, Iris? Can we go come back to that? We can go back to it if you'd like. Um, I also just posted the registration link in the chat box. Um, oh. So go ahead and follow oh, that so link. We're open like questions for a few minutes. Yeah, we do have, and we have a number of questions coming in. Uh, if you have others, feel free to submit them. Um, but I'll just start in right away here, um, Peggy. First question, um, can you talk about Queen Anne's lace? Does ah. the white tops off help prevent seeds? Yeah, um, yeah, it, it is, it's not as awful as some of these other ones that I have been talking about. It is indeed a, a, a non-native brought in. Uh, yes, you can definitely cut the, the tops off and prevent it from going to seed. You can also pull it or dig it, again, depending on how soft the ground is. Sometimes it'll, the whole plant will pull. Uh, some people leave them because they're sort of pretty and they leave them while they're blooming and then get rid of them right after that. And sure enough, more will come back the next year. Okay, great. Um, do you have a particular herbicide product that you'd recommend for buckthorn? Uh, well, I, I, I am sorry to have to say it, but Roundup is typically the one. Um, there are products that have the glyphosate in them, and, and that's what does the killing. And, and uh, you, you know, you have some things that, uh, that some others, for example, that would maybe kill the garlic mustard, like the, um, uh, the broadleaf weed killers. Uh, though they wouldn't work on buckthorn or whatever, but uh, and and there is, by the way, a, um, a Roundup that is for woody plants, and I don't know exactly what its specific title is, but uh, I just use it. I just have one Roundup, and I try not to use it until I absolutely have to, and it, and also I use it on whatever. Peggy, can I yeah. mention also? If people are using herbicide anywhere where it's close to water, the herbicide needs to be a special formulation that is safe to use near water. It's not the herbicide itself, it's the what they call the surfactant is damaging to aquatic life. So you'd want to consult with a, a firm that does uh, natural areas, uh, restorations or something like that and maybe having have them come in and do it. But you can't use Roundup because it's it's not formulated for use near water. That's, thank you, Carol, for catching that. That's absolutely on target. Uh, the other, the other, that's also one of the reasons that we, we sponge uh, or, or, uh, or paint, but usually sponge the, the, the reed canary grass leaves or something. So it's only going on the leaves and it's not being sprayed into the air and landing on the water. Yeah, you really need to be careful about that around around water. Okay. 
Another question. So you mentioned that insects don't particularly like invasive species because they're not native. Um, does that mean that planting native plants will create a serious insect problem? Well, it, it, it's not a problem. It, it is a, a, a sort of a collaborative relationship that the, the insects, the butterflies, the bees that, that like the native plants because they've evolved with them, don't kill them or they wouldn't either be here anymore. Uh, so over all the, all the millennium, they've, they've worked out a relationship that they, you know, that they can co coexist. Uh, so you might get a few holes in the leaves, but it, it's not going to kill the plant. The case of the, of the uh, viburnum borer that I talked about, that's not a native insect. It's a, it's a native plant, but it's an imported insect that probably came in with some cultivars from someplace. So no, uh, it, it, it's not, a, it, I, I've never heard anybody who has native plants call it an insect problem. When they have an insect problem, it's because it's an invasive insect like the, like the Japanese beetle or something, but they, they all go on everything, not necessarily just native plants. Okay, thanks Peggy. Um, another question, purple coneflowers. Um, someone has a decent area of purple coneflowers, but they would like to move a portion of them to another section of their property. What time of year is the right time to transplant purple coneflower? They are pretty tough. You can do it probably most any time. If you did it right now while they're blooming, the blooms will, will die back quicker. So don't do it now. But right after they're done blooming or even in the early in the spring, uh, as soon as you know, they've got enough leaves on them so you can tell that you, know, you, get, the, you get a good root ball with them. But, but they're pretty easy to transplant. So okay. uh, lucky that you have enough of them, you can move to another area. That's great. And the bees yeah. like them. A couple people writing in with some additional plants that they're struggling with. Um, one is chameleon plant. Another one, Bishop's Weed. Do you oh, have boy. any suggestions for either of those? Yeah, I don't know the chameleon plant. Maybe Carol can jump in on that, but let me just talk yeah. about the Bishop's Weed. That's best to smother it if you can. If it's a big mat of it, uh, you can use a black plastic or you can just even use uh, a, a several layers of newspaper that you wet in the fall and then put uh, mulch on top of it to hold it down over the winter and that should kill it by next spring. But, but I'm not familiar with the wet, well, wet at all because that's it sends by it, it you know the roots go everywhere so you you'll have one coming up around the edges but but keep persevering because it, you know you can the first year you get most of it the next year you get a little bit more and pretty soon you've got it going. I'm not familiar with the chameleon plant either Peggy and it, it might be something that's got a popular name that we might know by a different name but I'm not familiar with that name, chameleon plant. I'll see if I can find anything on it. Carol, this would be a good time for you to talk about some of the other resources, though, for, for finding other of, of other kinds of invasives. Because as I mentioned, I only talked about 12, and you, know, you can yeah. come up with lots more. One, one of the things I like to encourage people to do is to go to the search bar on Google and type in a few keywords that are going to bring up a lot of results and one of them is you use the word invasive plant control and then maybe add a location like Chicago or Midwest or something like that so you're not going to get information that's pertinent to California um, there's a, an invasives.org I believe and it's it's not just about invasive plants but there's going to be a selection that you can make on the website that will talk about plants and i found um i found a website for a the conservancy in wisconsin a long time ago uh, the pleasant valley conservancy are you familiar with that peggy uh, um, their, their website is absolutely full of information about native plants and controlling invasives so I would definitely uh, should see if you can locate the website for the Pleasant Valley Conservancy. There's also information on some of our, you know, like Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, if you, you know, if you do that internet search for in place of invasive plant control, 
Uh, you might find things from, you know, an adjacent state. You might find something from Fish and Wildlife Service. But there's just a ton of information. And the best there's thing. There's also a book if you really want to have a handy reference at home that you can turn to that um, is by a, a woman named Zarapata, C-Z-A-R-A-P-A-T-A. -A -A. Uh, I forget what her first name is, but the last name is pretty distinctive. And um, that book is on invasives. And one other thing I'd like to mention is that if you are working with a property that has a variety of invasive problems, there are a couple of different things that affect your decisions about when you're going to go after what. So with garlic mustard, for instance, or Dame's Rocket, for instance, you want to try to get the plants out before they go to seed. Both of them are biennials, although I think Dame's Rocket is maybe just a tender perennial to tell you the truth. Both of them are in the mustard family. So the kinds of little seed uh, pods that you get on garlic mustard, you're also gonna get those on Dame's Rocket. And it's very important, especially with the Dame's Rocket, that if you're going to pull them, you try to get your hand all the way at the base of the stem or stems and pull and get the whole root ball out and not let it break off at the ground level. Um, that's right, because it'll re-sprout from there. That's right. Um, there was something else I was going to mention, and I, I lost my train of thought. But um, how are we doing for time, uh, Iris? Are we okay? Yeah, or we we should we should wrap up here. But I did have one quick question, um, Carol. Could you repeat the name of the author for that book you just mentioned? Zara Pata, C Z A R A P A T A, Zara Pata, but the, the initial C is silent. So it's, it's all a lot of A's between um, consonants. Zara so the first letter is Z as in zebra? C Z A, yeah, oh, right. Z, Z okay. as in Carol, <laughs> Z as in zebra, yes. And I don't know if it's currently in print, but I'm sure you could probably find a used copy on the internet. There's a couple of uh, book, uh, booksellers that are uh, aggregators. Something, uh, there's a place, uh, one called Book Finder. And if you search with the author's name, uh, you should be able to find a copy at a bookseller that, uh, would be very reasonable and i think their prices and uh, book finder include the cost of shipping okay great thanks carol um and so much uh again thanks peggy uh for your presentation very informative tonight uh there's a couple uh remaining questions that we didn't have time to get to but we can follow up with those um and get you answers so thanks everyone for joining tonight. Uh, look forward to um, hearing from us with the recording and also look forward to seeing you at next month's webinar. Have a good evening. Nice weather. <laughs>